Welcome to the part of Opera Babylon where we ask the question, is opera dying? Today, my special guest is internationally renowned director Thaddeus Strasberger, and he is here to discuss with me the myth of opera dying. I will ask him ten questions, the same ten questions I will ask every guest, culled from the headlines of the newspapers explaining why opera is dying. That, of course, is Florence Foster Jenkins, who Meryl Streep is rumored to be playing in a movie soon. I have to tell you, I knew Meryl Streep when she was a young actress, and she used to pretend to be Florence all the time in the dressing room. My guest Thaddeus Strasberger has been in much demand around the world since winning the prestigious European Opera Prize in 2005 for his production of La Cenerentola. He has also directed in the United States, around the world, and most recently at Covent Garden and in Russia. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm very excited to have you here. I've been... Uh, I've been kind of drooling over your latest production of uh, I Dui Foscari. Uh, that was the one I could actually see and hear uh, from, from America. And, uh, and I've always wanted to hear Placido in, the, in that kind of baritone role. I saw him in the Salzburg um, uh, Trovatore as Count di Luna, and I was kind of intrigued. Did you enjoy working with Placido? Very much so. I mean, he brings to that role something really special that a lot of people can't. It's, um, he's playing the doge who's meant to be in his mid-80s, and I just think there's sort of an age and a wisdom and an experience that he, as a, as a character, as a human being, brings to that role. And actually, vocally, I think that it fits him very, very well. It sort of speaks to his strengths. I think in opera, there's a lot of sort of divisions about what's a tenor and what's a baritone and what's a bass, and talking about subtleties of color and tessitura and all of this. But the thing that we need to get back to is about playing a character and are you inhabiting uh, a real humanity on stage? And I think that he does that so well. Yeah, he totally does. I mean, he's a, he's a man of the theater, and I think that I think that that's right. I think that experience is something that we don't necessarily treasure in the opera because uh, it's like, well, can he sing it or not? It's like, well, actually, these are characters. They're supposed to be fully dimensional characters from the beginning of the opera to the end. That's how the composer saw them. Is is that is that what you're saying? Absolutely, and I think that what you can bring to a role is vocal prowess, you can bring strength, you can bring weakness, you can bring a sort of insight, you can bring a vulnerability. I think it's a whole package of things that you can bring, and I don't think that any performer ever gets it 100% right in any role, which is why we keep going back to operas and seeing different performers, different productions, because it's never 100% right. Um, in, in Performances and you start to form your perfect world um, through the multiplicity of the experience, but not through just one night at the opera. No, absolutely, absolutely. Well, that, that that's that's cool. That leads very well into the ten questions of whether opera is dying. Now, I can already hear in your voice and and, and attitude that you're in the thick of it, and from your point viewpoint, opera isn't dying. Is that correct? Well, I think opera dies every night when the curtain comes down, and the responsibility to bring it back to life is with those people who are making it uh, the, the very next morning to get back in rehearsal and get back on stage and bring it to life. Um, so it's a cycle, of course. It's a contemporary art form. Even if we're doing productions of Mozart or Monteverdi or even older um, or, or contemporary work, 
works or big 19th century stuff. It's not alive until we breathe uh, humanity and life into it. They're just scores that sit on a page with a bunch of lines and a bunch of dots and some text. And of course they're dead. That's not alive. But there's many thousands of people around the world that do wake up every morning and breathe life into it, which makes me think it's very much alive and kicking. I would say so. I know I can only think of, there's probably about 4 million temps in New York right now who are saying it better not die. Question number one. Is opera just for old people? Is it, these, all of these are based on things I'm reading in the press that are myths. So is opera just for old people? No, absolutely not. I think that, uh, I mean, I don't even know where that comes from because where I go to the opera, it's not filled with only old people. It's filled with a lot of different kinds of people. Um, and it, it, there may, uh, I don't even know how to answer that question, to be honest with you, because I feel no is the answer. It's for anybody who decides to buy a ticket and turn up. I started going to the opera when I was about 12 years old because I happened to go to one and I wanted to go again and I bought tickets to it. Um, that's only one sort of anecdote, but it's certainly possible that the art form can speak to people of many ages. Absolutely. Yeah, well, the only reason I bring it up is that the Met Tripolitan Opera has kind of uh, said that 75% of their audience is over 65, and that's why they can't make ends meet. Do you think that's true, or do you think people are just kind of playing with numbers a little bit? Um, I'm sure that may be true for one institution, but we have to remember that one company doesn't sort of dictate what the entire experience of the entire art form is for people around the world. There's, I mean, even opera as an art form is, is so sort of wide-reaching, what it can be, where it takes place, how it's put together, how it's produced. Um, it doesn't just mean one opera house in the biggest city in America. Uh, so many different forms around the world. I think there are several barriers to going to the opera, one of which is the ticket prices are often perceived as being higher than other forms of entertainment, um, even though I don't believe that it necessarily is. Uh, you compare it to season tickets to major sporting events like the Yankees or compare it to the price of a ticket for a Lady Gaga concert, um, I think you'll find actually that opera uh, comes out quite favorably. Oftentimes people like to talk about the most expensive box seat for an opening night at the opera. Yes, of course, at the Metropolitan Opera Covent Garden you can pay probably $1,200 for a ticket, but you can also get in the door for $20. Um, so I think the perception of the ticket prices is something that may keep younger people away. Another thing that I think plays into it is the options and the choices that younger people are accustomed to that maybe older people aren't um, just through sort of the history of technology. Now we have Netflix, lots of things on our computers, um, so many different media vying for our attention. So maybe at the end of the day, if you really are interested in opera, it's one of 20 things that you're interested in, whereas maybe for an older generation um, who aren't so tapped into, you know, binge watching Orange is the New Black on Netflix, maybe default to the opera a little bit sooner. I don't know. <laughs> I wish there was more opera on Netflix, to be honest. I think all they have is Otello. It would be great if there were more opera available. I think there are more and more things available on YouTube and, um, you know, sort of pirate recordings of what's going on. And it's a way to get a real taste for what's happening um, without the expense of traveling and um, buying tickets all the time. And I don't think that that necessarily is uh, competing um, for uh, ticket sales because I think the more that you watch it, the more that you want to see it, and maybe the more likely you are to buy tickets when it is available. Um, near you. Question number two. Is opera too boring for millennials? Absolutely. I think a lot of it is really stullifyingly boring. Um, because I think that there's this um, a real sort of cancer that is invading opera practice, and that is to imitate the artistry of somebody else. And I think people can smell a rat really, really fast when you are singing something, playing something, conducting something, directing something, acting something in a way that's copying a tradition that you believe that you've inherited. There's a way that you can get, be inspired by performances of the past, that, the same way that maybe Amy Winehouse was inspired by the jazz greats, Ella Fitzgerald, for example. You hear um, bits and pieces, but nobody's just doing a, a sort of cover uh, version um, in the pop world and being huge 
hugely successful with it. We we sort of value originality and and vulnerability and, and a real kind of insight to humanity. And I think that's lacking in about 90% of the opera performances that are out there. Everybody's trying to sort of play dress up, and um, it, it doesn't sort of reach out and grab you because somehow you know that you're watching a photocopy of a photocopy. And I think it's a real problem. But those few performances that do get made that are fully committed to reinventing um, in, in, in a fresh way exactly what was already there, I think are the, are the things that reach out and grab people, well, certainly grab me, and make me, give me hope that it's not, that it's not boring. Wow. Do, do you think, okay, so question three actually segues nicely. Do, do there need to be new operas, more like Broadway shows? You know, Broadway's constantly turning out new shows on new subject material. Does opera need to run kind of the same way, do you think? Um, it, it, it's so tricky because there's so many great things that are in the, the repertoire that are, are worth repeating and worth mining again for sort of uh, new information and new insights. But there is, that, that, that you do run the risk I think that suspense is something that um, is integral to the way we tell stories. That's why, um, you know, serial television shows are written with a, a sort of a cliffhanger so that you will tune in next week. And we've got an inherent problem with um, the standard rep works like Tosca. We know that she jumped at the end. That's something that is no longer a surprise. It, it can't give you the same uh, excitement and, and, and sense of surprise as if you didn't know what's going on. Um, so for operas that do rely on a sense of um, surprise or suspense, um, I think we do need new stories because I think that's something that um, humans enjoy and it, it plays out in other media. I mean, that's why we like watching The X Factor. Um, because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, there's a sense of risk and um, unknown uh, that's about to occur. And that's, with, with old opera, not necessarily possible. So new operas with new subject matter um, certainly can help in that regard. Did you see the, um, the Nicole Smith opera in, in, in London? I did. I just saw it in the revival about two months ago. What, what did you think of it? I thought it was really interesting. I mean, one thing... Um, that it has going for it in that regard is that there is no suspense because we know what the story is already. And um, it's interesting to explore something um, kind of vertically in a way. Like we often sort of hear about these things um, in just the sort of little snippets about the Anna Nicole Smith story, but to put it together for several hours and to explore um, sort of the themes and its absurdity, um, the sort of mocking our own interest in um, these sort of tabloid details of other people's lives. I found it to be um, quite refreshing, actually. Are there good singers anymore? Absolutely. There's phenomenal singers. I hear them every day. <laughs> I know it's funny to me that people in the press are going around saying, well, there just aren't any singers anymore. But I, I see there's them. there's a lot of factors involved. I think it's, um, as we look back through with the lens of history, um, you can sort of cherry pick some really amazing, extraordinary um, performances that happen to have been caught, either in studio recordings or live recordings, that really do sort of stand out as um, truly exciting moments of, you know, operatic musical theater. Um, but for every um, one of those, there are hundreds of thousands of others that are um, rather ordinary um, in the quest of being extraordinary. I, I don't think anybody, you know, sets out to, you know, put Aid on the stage and say, well, we'll put sort of a, a mediocre night on stage. Everybody's <laughs> trying for the best. But there are so many factors that, um, that go into making uh, a great singer. And I think that there's lots of great singers out there, not all of whom are having a great night every time they they strut about the stage and open their mouth because they're human beings just like an athlete or any other sort of performer um, sort of has ups and downs. And I think one of the things with opera performers is because it's such an unprocessed, unfiltered experience. You know, there's no electronics, there's no engineers, there's no um, sort of improving anything that, that you're doing on stage whilst you're doing it. I think we're, uh, opera singers are much more prone to the vulnerabilities of the the precariousness of the human body and, and soul and mind as it, as it has its ups and downs. And we get so accustomed to hearing sort of perfect 
sounds, as it were, perfectly engineered sounds from so many different other media. You're never going to see a bad performance from, a truly bad performance from an amazing movie star because all of those bad performances end up on the, the cutting room floor and you keep reshooting it until you get something that's, that's pretty good. Um, so I think the comparison to, to other things has not been favorable to opera um, for the very reason that makes opera exciting, for its very unfilteredness and, and directness that it brings. And also with um, what do you want from a voice? I mean, these operas were written many, many times for theaters that are much smaller than most American opera houses. And if you're looking for sort of size and volume and sort of sheer um, scale, um, works really well in a 1,200-seat house, but a little bit less well in a 3,500-seat house. Um, so I think it's really sort of unfair to say that some of the voices, maybe we should say we don't have the theaters for the voices uh, that we do have that would, um, you know, be much easier to cast a trovatore if a regional house in America was a 900-seat house the way a lot of regional theaters are in, in Europe. Wow, that's a huge one. That question, uh, let's see, we're on number five now. Is, do you think that opera is too expensive or cost prohibitive? Um, you know, again, you know, people in America look to the Met. You know, he spent a lot of money on uh, th over thirty million dollars on the Ring, and it wasn't it wasn't great. It wasn't awful, but it wasn't it wasn't great. You know, the one set piece for you know several almost eighteen hours could be a bit much for people. But uh, <laughs> but do you think that operas just become too expensive to, to, to mount a production? Um no, I don't think it's too expensive because uh, I mean that's that's a that's actually a really difficult question. I mean are you you're asking whether the productions themselves are too expensive or whether ticket prices are too expensive or whether the, the, the fees and um Salaries are too expensive. What, what, which part of it are you? Um, this, you know, at? managing it, managing the production, producing the production from you know from paper to to physical manifestation, building the set pieces and all of that. Do you think that that's become too cost prohibitive? It's it's difficult to see in America because people here feel that money is constantly being wasted on productions and so on and so forth. Well, there are a lot of costs associated with things because they're very specialized skill, and there's no sort of um, automation to it. Every production that you're doing is sort of a unique work of art, and so you can't sort of have a production line, and there's no um, real efficiency, and I think it's a very inefficient way to make things. Being being creative um, is by definition uh, oh, not efficient, because you can't sort of replicate it one after another. Um, and the, the people that you need to make the things, and, and the sets, and the costumes, and the props, and and everything, if they're very highly specialized um, skills that have to be constantly ready to be used. And I think that you, you're never wasting money by spending it on productions. For example, in that the Prince Igor, they talked a lot about you know spending several hundred thousand dollars on making um, some poppies. I think, well, but those were all trained craftspeople that were making things for the opera house and providing livelihoods for those artists to, to survive and to, to live and work in society, uh, creating art. And I don't have any problem with spending the money. I think that less than reining in the costs, maybe we have to figure out how to increase the amount of support that goes uh, to these arts institutions. I mean, a lot of people don't realize how much the taxpayer is supporting uh, the building of new stadiums and with tax breaks to bring in businesses um, around sports events and um, other arena events and even, you know, big um, pop performers and country western performers, their performances end up being subsidized um, by uh, local governments in ways that um, the actual local arts are not supported. I think that's something that we should look at. Well, that, I think uh, 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 that brings up an interesting thought, too, that I was just thinking while you were saying that, because it, it, it made me think, well, you know, there are a lot of people in the opera company, you know, who manage the opera company, upper, upper, upper management, that don't really have a creative role. They stand more as a figurehead for the opera, the, the, the GM and stuff. And some of them make quite excessive salaries that I feel they could put back into their productions, instead of maybe making quite so much money. Um, I think that you have to look really carefully at how many performances are actually making it to the stage um, each year. And that's one of the big differences between working in America and working in Europe, is that um, a 
mid-sized German opera company may be putting on 450 nights of theater um, in because they'll have uh, more than one venue. Oftentimes they have a large space, the main, the main theater, and then they'll have a smaller space, and then most of them have an even sort of off kind of space, a cabaret space or a smaller comedy theater, and they're putting on that many performances a year. So if you take a look at a general manager's salary and divide it out by the number of performances that you're putting on, you'll find that it's a much smaller number um, in Europe than it is in America. And I think that's what we need to be looking at is what is the value of the money that goes into the company, how much of it is actually ending up on stage. I definitely think that you have to pay people for their expertise in managing resources, that that is something that's required in an opera company, and that you have to pay people um, certain amounts that to have that sort of expertise and devotion to uh, a, a difficult task. Um, but it's the, the checks and balances on the system are, um, I think you can find many, many examples where it seems to be out of whack. Um, with the, the larger picture. Another thing, too, that you have to look at in American companies is because the number of performances are so low during the year, um, you have to sort of look at are there other efficiencies? Can things be combined between companies? Do you really need an accounting person uh, to a full-time accountant within your company to manage maybe 15 full-time employees and then seasonal employees? Or is that something that maybe could be um, sort of combined or outsourced with other um, local arts organizations that you could team together to sort of pool together some of these administrative tasks or even with ones in, in other cities? We'll have more from Thaddea Strasberger in a moment. But first I wanted to take a moment and spotlight a new album from a wonderful soprano, Maria Luigia Borsi. Here is a track from her recently released Italian Soprano Arias from Noxos Records, and her voice is divine.
amazing. That is Maria Luigia Borsi singing Catalani's La Voili aria, Eben ne andrò lontana. Next, I'd like to make a little Christmas gift suggestion. If you have an operatically inclined child, they might like this. Actually, the day I started composing music for family audiences, I can remember, it was a great day. My son was seven years old at the time, and he came home running from school and he said, Daddy, Daddy, you can't be a composer, you're not dead. And at that moment, I knew that I had to change that perception. And so I decided I would write some music so that he would realize that actually composers are alive. So really, almost every book that I ever set to music started as just something that I read to my kids. When I asked Santa smiled, then he gave me a hug and told an elf to cut a bell from a reindeer's harness. I mean, the fact that Nathan Gunn was willing to do this, you know, to take a book like Polar Express and bring it to life is so fantastic. I'm sure if Chris von Allsberg were there at that moment, he would say, whatever I had in my head, Nathan Gunn was it. And I think that's really the power of all great performers. We were here in New York, and I actually think there was a humongous blizzard that year, or something like that. And I'd gotten a number of these uh, children's stories to read to Madeline. She was little, and that was the, uh, the Polar Express was one of them. I thought that so much music for kids sort of looks down at kids and writes really simple music as if all they can really handle is that. And one of the things I love about writing music for kids, is particularly when I do those concerts live, for the first time they get a sense, well, there could be a piece by Mozart on the concert, but there's also a piece by Rob. To the North Pole, of course. You are listening to Opera Joe's Opera Babylon. Next time on Opera Babylon, Operatic Disasters. Perle Nere from the world of opera. Even the greats can make mistakes. She's not one of them. You inspired some thoughts in me because I was realizing that, you know, a lot of people, you know, we have some houses that have full repertoire, like San Francisco, Chicago, and the Met, uh, and, and, and even Seattle. Um, but, you know, Seattle being the less performances of, of, of that big group. But most opera companies, you're right. It's They're doing maybe two operas a year, maybe three. And uh, a lot of their time is actually devoted, should be devoted, to community outreach. But if you think about mid-sized opera companies in, in America, and the, uh, often at times a city will have a symphony, they'll have a ballet, and they will have a, um, an opera company as well as a, as a straight theater company. And you think, well, in, a, in the German system, all of those things are combined. So if you could have one development director that was um, attracting um, money from, from donors and, and sponsors into the big umbrella arts organization, maybe that would be enough instead of each of these four companies having independent staffs doing all of those things separately, and in a way sort of being in competition with each other, well, I've already given money to the ballet, so I have less money to give to the opera, as opposed to giving to just sort of a thriving arts uh, organization that, that combines all of them. Yeah, no, well, it's, you know, Seattle tried to do that. Uh, they still do it. They have a council and they have the, you know, the, this Beethoven fund that was given to them, um, and uh, 
but they don't, you know, they don't play well always together, and they're always fighting to to get their separate kingdoms a little bit. Uh, so, uh, interesting well, that America often plays this even in other political realms, of, in you know, with healthcare and with military and with human rights and gay rights and and everything. That like somehow things in America are just different. But why is it that the system of combining symphony ballet? theater and opera works really, really well in other highly developed nations like in Germany and in France and in Russia and in Norway <laughs> and in Sweden. And, you know, the, the list goes down the line. How are these places able to have functioning gun control laws, functioning socialized health care, and functioning combined um, performing arts organizations? But in America, somehow... Well, it's just that the opera and the, the ballet are very different and they can never get along. So we need to hire two administrative assistants, two box office people, two production managers, two events coordinators, two company managers. I mean, the list just goes down the line. It's yeah. ridiculous. No, it, 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 it does get ridiculous. Uh, even, even when they're all housed in the same theater, they're still all pulling administrative staffs. And it, it actually gets really confusing. <laughs> and it's not in their best interest, you know. Um, well, let, let's let's move on to the next question. Question number six: Is opera for the whole family? Can you take? Can you just put the kids, you know, into the SUV and head on down to the opera house? I think it's really hard to generalize about what opera is. There's so many different things that it can be. Um, it, it can be um, simple and charming and kid friendly, but I'd say a lot of the things that end up on the stage are about rape and murder and incest and uh, depression <laughs> and suicide and um, I mean all those things I mean are they kid friendly or not I'm not a parent I would probably take my kids to see them um, but I was working at an opera in Opera Colorado some years ago and to the final dress rehearsal uh, the outreach and education department had invited um, some local school groups as, um, and one mother uh, was a um, uh, a homeschooling mother and she had brought her family and she wrote an angry letter the next day saying she couldn't believe how outrageous the production was and that she thought she was bringing her children to a wholesome Mozart operatic production and had no idea that it would be so um, uh, sexualized and violent. And I thought, well, who hasn't done their homework then about Don Giovanni in which the first two minutes of the opera there is a rape and a murder and it just goes downhill from there with the subject matter being a serial rapist. Um, so I would bring my kids to that because it's like, why not? But if that's not for you, then um, no, keep the kids at home. Well, it always cracks me up a little bit, little bit because it's become clear to me over the years that anyone will watch anything that appears on a television set. Anything. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, and we've stopped decrying violence on television for the most part. I mean, here and there you'll hear a little thing. But then for someone to take a stand so it appears in the newspapers that the opera house is, you know, sexually charged or volatilely violent, you know, always strikes me as ridiculous. <laughs> or filled with nudity when if you just compare it as a walk through the Vatican or the, the National Gallery or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you're going to see a lot more breasts and penises there than you will on most operatic stages. And yet, um, you see a little bit of that on stage and um, people cry foul. Well, the, the kind of nicely segues to the next question. Is opera as thrilling as a movie? Can, can opera be as thrilling as a movie? Well, I think one of the things that opera has that movies don't is that the actual event is taking place in the same room with you, and there's actual sort of hormones and pheromones and adrenaline flowing between uh, the stage and the audience when things are going just right. And um, yes, I think that that can um, rival the, um, the sense of immediacy and action that uh, you can find in the cinema. Um, however, I think the cinema can also prove to be much more thrilling um, than what you see on the opera stage if uh, the level of performances uh, isn't up to it. Uh, you can't say that one is better than the other, but I think they both have potential to be amazing art forms that are completely worth engaging in. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can't wait for the first hybrid opera movie where it's little of both or they're integrated. You know, I know they've tried this in some opera houses with holographic settings, but uh, but I'm looking forward to see if we can actually get screens that people can walk through or interact with too. 
Okay, let's see. Question number eight. Does the opera house of a, of, a, of a town belong to the local community, or does it belong to the wealthy people of that community? I think that the opera house belongs to the community. I grew up in a working class family in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was first invited to the opera house through the outreach department of Tulsa Opera that invited um, local schools to come to the um, dress rehearsal for production of Tales of Hoffman, and then um, I was invited back for a look-in, and then I went to another dress rehearsal, and so I always thought the Opera House was some place that I belonged in. Um, I think having that sort of open-door policy, not just for buying tickets to an opening night and a weekend, um, but having people come in... Um, sort of as part of a school or sort of outreach situation, uh, sort of gives you a, a taste and a flavor and lets you know that all are indeed welcome. And somehow, I mean, I don't know exactly how it happened, but after those experiences, I and my family were able to afford tickets to go to the opera. So it can't have been prohibitively expensive because there were lots of things that we actually did go without, um, I'm sure, as a, as a kid, that, that were too expensive. But I don't remember the, the opera house being off limits, either sort of, you know, sort of spiritually that we weren't allowed in because we weren't, um, you know, local aristocracy or um, <laughs> the tickets were too expensive. Yeah. No, it's funny. I mean, you know, you and I, of course, met through Tulsa Opera and, and Regional Opera in the Oklahoma area way back when you were a kid, <laughs> I hate to say. But, you know, I, I always felt we were kindred spirits because when I used to run away from home, I would run to the opera house. The theater was the comforting place for me to go. Do you think that that's just an oddity that we share? Or do you think that a lot of kids look towards the theater or towards the opera stage or just to the, the stage in general as a place where they might be able to be heard? Well, I really like going to the theater because I thought it was a place of where anything was possible. And I just thought it seemed like a very hopeful place uh, where you could sort of create your sort of own realities and really work together with other people. I mean, for me, I never really liked playing sports as a kid because I didn't like the sort of artificial sort of competition that was set up. And I thought, well, why do we not like those people just because they live on the other side of town and happen to go to another school that they have to be our rivals? Why can't we get together with them and make something really amazing? And I find in theater because there's, I mean, there may be competition, you know, with sort of within things, sort of elbowing for position and status and things that sort of comes along with the territory. But overall, you're, you're there with a the sort of common goal to make something really extraordinary that's going to move people and uh, engage with other people, learn from other people, and share experiences and basically not feel lonely in the world. And so for me, that was a huge refuge. Wow, wonderful. So let's see, question number nine. We're almost at the end. <laughs> um, now, I've been reading a lot of articles, so I kind of put this question together because there have been some accusations that there may be corruption in opera. Um, corruption, you know, meaning that, you know, people who shouldn't get roles get roles and people that do don't and, you know, kind of the other, the the... <laughs> the more negative side of the business aspects, you know, in terms of, you know, who gets to be in the paper and so on and so forth. Do you think that there is actually corruption or do you think it's sour grapes? I think it's probably a little bit of both. I mean, there's lots of reasons that people get any sort of job anywhere in the world, whether you're on stage or off stage. A lot of it has to do with um, merit-basedness, uh, just how good are you, and um, a lot of it has to do with who you know, a lot of it has to do with who you slept with, a lot of it might be who thinks you might be soon to sleep with them, but I mean that's not limited to, to the opera stage. I think the opera becomes sort of microcosm for what's happening in the larger political world. I wouldn't say that the, um, the forces at play are any more nefarious than might be at the um, political level. Um, or in a sort of large corporation. I think in America, there's this sort of um, fantasy that goes on about everybody um, sort of living in a meritocracy, and if you're the best, you'll sort of rise to the top. And um, I think that just sort of goes against thousands of years of human history and how things work. Um, I think that your base talent has a lot to do with it, um, but I think that there's other factors that um, how you position yourself, how other people choose to position you, that can um, that, that can affect you as well. Uh, there's also 
personality issues in dealing in a freelance sort of operation uh, where there's not a lot of security. I think some people naturally excel better at self-promotion um, than other people, and they may be better at self-promoting than what their actual talent is, and there may be somebody that is amazingly talented that isn't able to um, sort of convince enough people at the early stages in their career to, to get the work that they need. Um, but I don't think that there is, um, you know, some sort of, like, scary sort of James Bond conspiracy out there to make sure that lesser talented people end up on stage. Uh, yeah. Because I also think, there's, you know, there's no, and it's such a, uh, what's the word, it's sort of a granular sort of broken up world that it's, it's, I think it would be impossible to have some sort of larger conspiracy theory at work because there's so many different people um, making decisions as to who gets work at various levels. And um, I just think that there are um, a, a lot of factors that go involved in, um, in who gets hired and how. And as long as you're traveling around and hearing a lot, you'll hear lots of good people. <laughs> well, finally, question number 10, and I actually put this one 10 inspired by you because, you know, I've been very much enjoying your productions and I'm very excited to see more and I hope that you get to do more in the U.S. Um, but this last question is one that a lot of people talk about and I actually see it on the stage quite a bit. So I'm, I want to get your take on this. Do you think there is a shortage of capable directors. Do I think there's a shortage of capable directors? Really difficult question because I think that the art of directing, the craft of directing, and your appreciation of it is so incredibly subjective because it has to do with, um, a, as an audience member, is it how you perceive of the piece in your mind, in your heart, like what do you think it's about? And do you think a good director is somebody who's bringing to life the vision that you already have in mind? And are, and are they sort of faithfully recreating, you know, your inner imaginary world? Or are you as an audience member going to see somebody else's interpretation that maybe challenges or is different or in opposition to the the production fantasy movie that you may have had in your mind. Um, so there may very well be a shortage of directors who are able to uh, custom create um, individual productions for every single member of the audience that may come to the stage. Uh, but I don't think that there's a shortage of directors who are able to um, closely read the libretti and the, the musical treatments of, of the operas and bring them to life in really fascinating, interesting ways. I think maybe there's more of a shortage of um, impresarios and theater managers that are willing to fully um, support directors' visions to get them to stage unaltered. I would say probably the types of productions, the sort of Euro trash or sort of hyper regie theater productions that um, get seen by many, many people are actually sort of deluded or corrupted versions of what the creative team was initially proposing. Um, and they end up sort of being um, sort of ill-conceived or, or half-hearted through the sort of hijacking process that can take place throughout the, um, the, the production development period. That's not so much the case maybe for more um, in, uh, avant-garde theaters in, uh, in, in Germany. Um, I think those things are well-supported and seen through to the end. But if you're looking at the larger things at the, to the Metropolitan Opera, San Francisco, um, or Chicago, oftentimes what, uh, what you get on stage in the end um, isn't uh, fully the vision of the director, even the conductor, as the, the production was conceived. Because maybe there's not enough rehearsal time. Maybe you have a fantastic idea that requires a lot of rehearsal time, but the cast that the theater has chosen to engage isn't there for enough rehearsal to fully engage in it. And maybe you have a singer who's sort of doing their performance or interpretation of a role as opposed to one that's created together in the safety of the rehearsal room. But um, uh, it's a matter of taste whether you like a director or not. But I think that there are many, many talented, educated, intelligent, and uh, people who know their craft working in theaters directing operas today. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, that's our 10 questions. 
And I love, I, I love the answers we have. I think that they're very different from a lot of what I've been reading about uh, opera in the U.S. Uh, and some of the fears and mythos around it. I think that in many ways we have a very uh, concerned press who is very, uh, you know, closely tight-knit with each other and kind of orchestrate these stories that... Because these stories, all of these questions have been the main headlines of the last 15 years of opera in the U.S. So it's really interesting to me to get your take on it. I love, love it, love it very, very much. Um, really interesting, Jody. You say that the, um, talking about the press and their sort of take on things. And I think you can, if you sort of look at the fact, you name the last 15 years, sort of the rise of the Fox News and the MSNBC and this idea of news and, and press as, as being a, a sort of um, an, a, a pity, anger, um, outrage inducing um, mechanism. I think that the classical music press is very much a part of that. That they're not just reporting what's actually happening on the opera stages, but that they are um, sort of fomenting this atmosphere of negativity that I think doesn't actually exist. I think the actual political situation, even in America, about Obamacare, for example, um, the Affordable Health Care Act, you know, already even sort of talking about it in those terms sort of starts to sort of lend an air to it. Uh, when you look at the statistics, millions of people are really happy with their health care coverage under the new, the new plans. However, if you read about it, you'll still be drawn to the stories about the negativity, the problems, the shortcomings of it. And I think in classical music, it, it doesn't make make a good story to talk about um, all of the, the successes of what's going on, um, but I think that people have found out that being kind of snarky and um, nasty and um, sort of playing into this idea of class warfare um, and uh, elitism and things, these are, these are subjects that people are drawn to for various reasons dealing with the, the economy and um, sort of uh, social anxieties. Um, but I don't think that it necessarily reflects the reality of what's happening in the larger artistic world. Let me ask you this, um, because I, I have, um, I've gotten a few, I've had a few, you know, corner room conversations from public radio to opera houses to theaters and ballet companies, and some of the fundraisers or development, uh, you know, officials for these companies feel that if they don't have a poor me story, if they don't reflect a poor me attitude, that they may not get the funding that they need from their donors because they're not behaving hand to cap. Instead of, you know, if they go around being joyous all the time, it's like they feel they won't get any money. Uh, do you think that that might play into some of that phenomenon as well? I think that you have to educate people who are giving money that it's not just about handouts to the poor, but it's about contributing to the success of the society in which you live. I mean, in America, there's such a huge income, an income gap between the, the richest and the poorest, and I think that that has to be redistributed, um, not just through um, more aggressive tax policies, but through uh, education of the people that do have the money, that the overall society is improved by contributing to successful arts organizations. And, um, yeah, I think that uh, maybe it's the, sort of this sort of 19th century Victorian idea of, like, please, sir, spare tuppence um, <laughs> that needs to, uh, to go away. And it's not just about sort of trying to keep these um, institutions afloat because somehow they're good for you, like eating your vegetables, but um, that they're part of an, uh, of an active society that, m that makes a good atmosphere for business, that makes people want to wake up in the morning and be productive and produce and, you know, contribute to the, their gross domestic output. Um, but at, at the end of the day, to have something that they're not just uh, uh, creating wealth, but that they're um, participating in communicating with people and that there's a, a, a kind of wealth that comes not from just the exchange of money, but it comes from the exchange of ideas, it comes from the exchange of um, breathing the same air with other people, and I think that there's a kind of um, a love and sympathy and peace that can come through interacting with people in ways that don't involve spending your money. I mean, I'm amazed in America that, uh, you know, an activity, the, you know, a family activity can actually be, let's go to the mall together, um, and that's sort of where you're going to interact 
with other people. But instead of going to the mall, shouldn't we be going to the opera house? Prophetic words, Maestro Strasberger. Thank you very much for coming and speaking to us. It's always great to speak to a fellow kindred spirit from the trenches of the industry. We will be asking the same 10 questions of every guest who comes upon this show. And if you disagree or have different opinions, I want to hear about them. So please either message me at Facebook or Twitter me at opera underscore Joe, J-Zero-E. Someone else has my true name out there. No names will be mentioned. Maria Luigia Borsi, our spotlighted album from Noxos, Italian soprano arias. That, of course, was O Mio Bambino Carro from Gianni Schicchi by Puccini. This next piece is a tribute to a, well, really the end of an era at the Metropolitan Opera. They are going to retire the Otto Schenk production of Die Meisterzinger von Nuremberg and... It's beautiful 40-year history. Also, James Morris, probably one of the leading Hans Sachs of our age, after Giorgio Tozzi, is probably going to never sing this role again. So here I have the aha moment from Die Meistersinger von Nuremberg, Selig wie die Sonne. 